Hi, I'm Aaron from Living Science Videos. You know, like it or not, we are heterotrophs, that is, uh, organisms that have to consume other living things for food. And eating food isn't exactly like putting fuel in a car either, because the fuel in the car only goes to one place, the rest of the car doesn't need it. But every cell in your body needs fuel as well as nutrients to grow and function and repair themselves. Food is a source of energy, which your cells convert into kinetic energy, which could also be described as work. You can use energy or convert it, but you can't create it or destroy it. That's the first law of thermodynamics. Even gasoline in our cars in an earlier form came from fossils of plankton hundreds of millions of years ago. One of those types of plankton, photoplankton, is an autotroph that gets its energy through photosynthesis from the sun. So we're back to the sun again. Every type of food we eat got its energy originally from the sun. We depend on autotrophs like plants to transform energy from the sun through photosynthesis into food we can eat, like vegetables. But as you can probably already predict, using the first law of thermodynamics, more commonly called the law of conservation of energy, the sun got its energy from another source too. A scientific law is a pattern observed repeatedly in nature. When most people think of laws, they think of the rules that governments make. However, what we call the laws of nature are actually observations expressed either as mathematic equations or simple summary sentences which have always been shown to be true. So based on the first law of thermodynamics, cellular respiration, the process where we get our energy, is not a process of creating new energy from nowhere. It is a process of transforming the energy in food, specifically the glucose molecule, into another form of energy we can use. Your body can use different types of food, like fats, proteins, and carbohydrates, to make the energy it needs. Where do we heterotrophs get the energy we need for our vital life processes? Cellular respiration or fermentation, a process that releases the energy we need through food in the presence of oxygen. In other words, since you use food as an energy source as well as a source of nutrients, you are what you eat. The different types of food contain different amounts of energy. The molecules in food release energy when the chemical bonds between their elements are broken. The energy in food is measured in calories. If you look at a food label, you'll see how many calories that item has. And people often count their calories when they're on a diet. A calorie is the amount of energy needed to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. That makes the phrase burning calories easier to understand because one of the forms of energy that food releases during cellular respiration is heat. Calories on food labels are measured with a capital C, meaning a kilocalorie or 1,000 calories. No discussion of cellular respiration would be complete without mentioning Sir Hans Adolf Krebs. He was already a well-known scientist in his native Germany in 1932. His reputation as a biochemist brought him world-renowned and later may not have saved just his life, but also his research for future generations. In 1933, Krebs' research came to an abrupt halt when he was dismissed by a Nazi policy purging all people of Jewish ancestry from public posts. Germany's loss was England's gain, as he had to move to England, and in 1937 he put the order of reactions in cellular respiration in correct sequence and received a Nobel Prize for his work, the highest honor in science. He called the cycle of chemical reactions that provides energy for many heterotrophic cells the citric acid cycle because citric acid is part of the process. However, it is more commonly known as the Krebs cycle in his honor. Take that, Nazis. This process is often described in terms of money or an economy. In the case of cellular respiration, the dollar that is circulating in the system is called ATP, which stands for adenosine triphosphate. It's a coenzyme that is often called the molecular unit of currency. It transports energy within a cell for metabolism. It's a key player in the cellular respiration economy, so keep that in your memory bank. You can see why it's called adenosine triphosphate if you look at the model of its molecular structure. Adenine forms the base of the molecule, which has three, hence triphosphates, attached to it. Water helps break the bonds between the phosphate groups and the molecule. This process is called hydrolysis. Hydro meaning water, and lysis refers to breaking things. These are high energy bonds, and 7.3 kilocal per mole of energy are released whenever the bond is broken. If you break one phosphate group off the molecule, it's called ADP, or adenosine diphosphate, di meaning two. If only one phosphate group is left, it's called AMP, adenosine monophosphate, mono meaning one. One way the process is not like money in a bank earning interest is that if you look at humans, we have at any given time only 250 grams or 8.8 .8 ounces of ATP in our bodies. While it is true that cellular respiration multiplies the amount of ATP our bodies use as energy, it also breaks ATP down at the same time to release energy. The cycle is constantly breaking down and rebuilding ATP. 
Over the course of a whole day, you will have recycled your own body weight in ATP. So how does the french fries that you ate for lunch or any other starches you eat every day turn into the energy your body needs? Not just starches, sugars are also carbohydrates too, and carbs get broken down during digestion into a simpler sugar called glucose. The glucose molecule is another big player in the cellular respiration process. If you look at the model of the molecule, you can see that it has six carbon atoms. You can see the breakdown of its elements and its chemical formula. If you remember the definition of cellular respiration, it is a process of breaking down food. How does a cell do this? It's a repeating cycle of chemical reactions that starts with the breakdown of glucose. The first stage of transforming glucose molecules to generate more ATPs for your body's energy needs is called glycolysis, a metabolic pathway that converts glucose into pyruvate and also generates a couple of ATPs and two electron carrying NADHs. Glucose is carried to your body's cells through your bloodstream. Perhaps you know someone who has the disease diabetes who has to monitor levels of glucose in their blood because having too much or too little blood sugar can have disastrous consequences. Once the glucose molecule arrives at the cell, the cell membrane lets it in and glycolysis begins in the cell's cytoplasm. Remember, the glucose molecule has six carbon atoms. Splitting the molecule in half requires energy, so we'll need to invest two ATPs to help create more ATPs and energy. As you can see, two ADPs are left after that reaction, and now there are two molecules that have three carbon atoms. The chemical reactions of glycolysis also removes four electrons, and these are passed to an electron carrier called NAD+, or nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. Try saying that five times fast. It is now called NADH, and the process has produced two of them. Uh, these molecules are not wasted. They're very important for the last two stages of cellular respiration, and they help produce even more energy. The two molecules with three atoms of carbon in them are called pyruvic acid, and they're vital to the next stage called the Krebs cycle. But before we go there, glycolysis needed two ATP to get going, but it produced four ATP in the process. So at this stage, we're up by two additional ATP. In order to complete the next stage of ATP production, pyruvic acid must enter the mitochondria, which produces most of the cell's power. When it enters the inner mitochondrial membrane, it meets up with an NAD. The reaction splits the three carbon atoms. One carbon atom forms a carbon dioxide molecule, which you eventually breathe out as a waste product. The other two carbons bond with one oxygen atom and two hydrogen atoms to form a molecule called acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA has two carbons, but it combines with a four-carbon molecule, oxaloacetate, to create a six-carbon molecule called citric acid. You may have felt the burn of citric acid if you ever accidentally got lemon juice in a cut. The reaction to synthesize citric acid is also a byproduct of more carbon dioxide. When you are breathing, it's just as important to get rid of excess carbon dioxide as it is to breathe in oxygen. Helpful NAD plus molecules knocks two of those carbon atoms off. In the process, you get another NADH electron carrier. Where does the NADH go with those electrons? They're vitally important later in cellular respiration. For the moment, we now have a four-carbon molecule that reacts with ADP to create another ATP. If you were wondering where the four-carbon molecule came from, earlier in the cycle, that helped make a six-carbon citric acid. Here it is. It recycles itself. That's why it's called the citric acid cycle, or the Krebs cycle. Before the molecule can make a complete cycle, it produces two carbon dioxide molecules, as well as a NADH and FEDH2, which is similar to NADH. Most importantly, remember there were two pyruvic acid molecules? One turn each in the Krebs cycle nets us two ATPs. So far, between the glycolysis and the Krebs cycle, we've netted four ATPs with an investment of two. However, by far, the next stage makes more power than the other two combined. But remember those NADHs and FEDH2s. The next process couldn't happen without them. It is important to note that even though cellular respiration is described in three stages, often in sequential order, the chemicals necessary for this process are flowing continuously throughout the mitochondria and the cytoplasm. Remember those two ATPs that we needed to jumpstart glycolysis? Where did they come from? The final stage of ATP production is the electron transport chain embedded in the inner mitochondrial membrane. And which molecules have electrons handy for the process? the NADHs and FEDH2s from glycolysis in the cytoplasm and the Krebs cycle in the mitochondrial complex. The electron transport chain is made of four membrane-bound complexes that are embedded in the inner mitochondrial membrane. These complexes accept high-energy electrons from NADHs and FEDH2s and pass them along the membrane. The energy generated by passing the electrons helps move the hydrogen ions lost from the NADHs and FEDH2s across the membrane. 
At the end of this chain, the enzyme ATP synthase does as the name suggests and synthesizes ATP with the help of positively charged hydrogen ions to keep things moving. The motion spins an ADP through the ATP synthase, attaching one more phosphate group to make it ATP. One other byproduct is water. This process nets the cell 32 ATP, so if we add the two ATPs from glycolysis and the two ATPs from the Krebs cycle, that makes 36 more ATPs per glucose molecule than we started out with in the beginning. This process is so efficient that it uses 36% of the energy of the glucose molecule and the rest of the energy is converted to heat. That's more efficient than most fuel sources. Every one of you watching this video is a powerhouse converting energy from food or glucose, which is originally stored energy from the sun. That energy is turned into ATPs and heat. Those ATPs are converted for your body's power needs like kinetic energy for moving body parts like your heart to beat. And you don't even have to plug yourself in to recharge. Just eat something. Mm -hmm.